Um, what is for you the relationship between image and word? Well, to describe me as a poet would be especially after my last very little joke exercise. You see that. I, I love, I love Dogger. I love Dogger. I love. I mean, and I can see that some of you do some of that when you want to as well. Um, Dogger, like Ogden Nash, uh, used to read that kind of thing a lot. And you know, I mean, I, I, I love, I love poetry, but I, I don't, I don't. So you, you don't write a lyrical little poem about a phenomenon? I've written poems about like, you know, different kinds of phenomenon. I've also done, every now and then, I just suddenly feel that that kind of love is a very good thing. Thank you. 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 Did you bring your guitar? Uh, I don't, I don't know, I'm saying for now. You sing it with us, right? I think now is the time. Um, Peter? Yeah. Can we do it last night? No, no, I'm going to get rid of it. Okay. Let me wait there. Yeah. Whether you want to say something, I want to ask you whether you want to say something specific about the words that you heard tonight. I mean, luckily for me, I mean, the dance is to speak, and I understand that the dance. I mean, I, every, every, every one of the poets sort of touched me in a very different way. I mean, the, 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 the genuineness of the reaction spark from the cartoons is the thing that, that got me most. That something that was highly appropriate for each for each image or for each notion that comes out of it. Because the cartoons, you know, when I when I get up in the morning and I'm looking for something to say, uh, which is not the easiest thing to get to. It's, it's it, I have to respond in such different ways to different to different things, and sometimes it'll be jokey and sometimes it will attempt to be profound and sometimes it will attempt to be um, you know, quite you know, quite diverse. And I think that everybody, yeah, that, that's the main thing. I think, I mean, every single person in the, in the, in the individual response is, is, is kind of hit the nail on the head with the, the style and the flight of fancy or the kind of gritty realism or whatever it is. It's, it's great. Yeah, okay. Uh, they would want to grill you and ask you, did you like this line? <laughs> Which one yeah. did you like? Did you like, did you like yeah. the eschatological bits? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jonathan, that can, can you make face the audience a little bit? Yes, sorry. Let me, let me, they want to see you. Let us turn around. Yeah. You sit yeah, yeah, there. Sorry, you sit there. Maybe to the center or something. Okay. 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 This chair broad based empowerment. You are a a comic story. Have you ever thought of writing a whole novel, a historical novel, uh, starting from the beginning to the end? Do you see what that object is? I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I, I've sort of, it's kind of passed my mind and very quickly. Like, like, <laughs> I just thought that uh, I, what, what, I think um, there, there are other things that I would like to do in, in, in kind of longer form, um, but, but probably not that. I, I won't try. But I, I mean, the longest thing that I've written is the text for my book, The Mandela Files, the big, the big uh, square one. Yes. I don't know if, if yeah, anyone, people have seen it, but I've got 100,000 words or something. Um, so you can imagine how long, I mean, I have problems with deadlines for 
each day. I don't know how long the publishers had to wait for that. But, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll come to the deadline for that deadline business. Now, it's just because you tend to give names to the books that people write. Peter, next one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you tend to give uh, names to the books people write. Now, what, is what, you, what you might title a book that you <laughs> I, I, well, I, I had thought of an epitaph at one point. I don't know about a book, but I thought that, that okay. no, just the late Jonathan Shapiro. But, um, a book. Uh, I, actually, I I have thought of a book book title, but I don't know if I'm. I, if I'm I, okay, I'll. I'll um, <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let it on yet. Okay, yeah. okay. No, no, I ask the question because often in your cartoons you, you, you telescope, or what's the word, they telescope here, uh, so your house is only for here, not here, and I mean, try a sort double exposure effect, the forward from the uh, secrecy book. Peter? <laughs> <laughs> Which is hilarious. Just on, in, in connection with that, I mean, for me, cartoons, are, what I want to say about cartoons is that they're um, about exaggeration and about, about the hypothesis, so sort of the hyperbole and the hypothetical, the, the what if. And then just as a sort of an extra thing that you can hang on that is, is you can make those connections with things that have happened before. Uh, and then, which is part of the what if. It's kind of what if it actually got that bad again. Yeah. So that, that, that's how those kind of things hang together for me. It's interesting. Uh, I want to ask you a question. What if, what if you had never dreamt of monsters when you were four years old? <laughs> I want to carry on because this is part of the historical thing that I want to follow through with. Uh, you seem to have also involved your personal development from a very small time in your, in your cartoons, because monsters abound. Would you like to, to say something about having those dreams? I mean, I, I think that most children uh, dream of monsters or, or are frightened by monsters in some way, and most children draw and and draw amazingly well, and are eventually kind of schooled to eventually draw badly. So it, that, that's as you sort of get more and more self-conscious, you lose that ability, and, and I think it goes for a lot of creative things. It, uh, young kids do things fantastically because they're so unself-conscious. So for me, yeah, I used to draw. Um, I started drawing a lot, and uh, I used to really enjoy drawing. And when when I had what Marlene's referring to is that I, I mean I had uh, uh, I was dreaming for a while of monsters and having these nightmares. And my my mother had, had a lot of insight. My mother was an amazing woman, and she said to me, she said draw the monsters, and she realised that would help me. And it was fantastic. I started drawing teeth and claws as many kind of scary, spiky things as possible. And, and it, it did help with the dreams, but I also sort of carried on drawing after that and, and, and made it more interesting. Your mother was a wise woman, it would seem. Uh, because in helped you to exercise those things. But later on, she also stood on your side. Yeah, very much so. I mean, my, look, you my, grew up in a politically sort of active, and practically active Yeah, and not, not in a way even the conventional kind of learning from an activist uh, and then becoming an activist sort of sort of home. Um, my, my mother was a, was a sort of, a, she was a frustrated activist. Um, my father's father kind of kept a lid on her activism and, and, and really threatened, as, as many people had, many people had that kind of situation, really threatened to kind of, uh, you know, sort of cut off the family if, 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 if we, we if she came. Yeah, and, and I, obviously there must be many people who had those experiences in, in many different sectors. And, uh, and and she used to just, she used to do a lot of kind of humanitarian things when she got the chance, and she would sort of tend towards the political. And then eventually, 
we all found a, a political home there. She was already, she's the age that I am now. She's, I think she was 53, I'm 53, when, 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 yes, when UDF was formed. And, um, and she and my sisters, and we all went along individually to this launch. We all kind of congregated from various parts of the peninsula and various friends of ours. And suddenly there was a political home for so many people that hadn't been one before. So she became a... Her sister as well. My, uh, there were three sisters. Three sisters. Yeah, so there were two. Well, two of them were really active in, in UDF, yeah. along with my mother and myself. And one, one was sort of outside of UDF and other, in other organizations. I want to refer to uh, one of your first extremely interesting um, yeah, I see it. It's very difficult to know it was a bit unclear. But maybe you can, you can identify your mother. <laughs> by, by the way, that, this is, that, that sort of stuff on the side was a kind of an, a kind of thing I did later. That's not the, there's, there's another version of it. Um, the main version doesn't have all the audio. There it is. Um, yeah, my mother's... Uh, this is my mother, Gaby. Um, funny enough, is that the, the ANC branch, the name of the ANC branch is, is actually called the Gaby Shapiro ANC branch, which I think sticks in some people's board. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because I mean, some people, and there are other people who, who, who you know, still say hello to me. But, but uh, yeah, and my mom became very active in, in along with the rest of us in Claremont EDF, but she really saw it through, you know, when things, when the change came, she just shifted all the, the huge storeroom of kind of, of red and yellow and black stuff, kind of shifted to a storeroom of, of, of green, yellow and black. It was amazing. It had a huge room full of paraphernalia that she'd either made or bought cheaply or imported or whatever. And uh, it, it was a sort of main store of, I, I, I call it the, the decorator of the struggle in the Western Cape. And uh, she got a lot of acknowledgement for Incredible work that she did, and uh, she, she was she was an amazing woman. Yeah. And what did she say about her amazing today? Well, she I feel her still on my shoulder. She she died about sort of 12, about 12, 12 years ago. Yeah, and I mean really, I'm I'm I must be one of the most unspiritual people around. But I, I that that thing of, of of feeling somebody who may who has had a huge impact in your life. Um, it's not as if you, have, you don't have to be spiritual. You don't have to believe that there's the spirit wandering around. But the impact on the impact on your life is as if she's sometimes she's kind of sitting on my shoulder and saying, uh, "I don't like that," or uh, yeah, giving me the thumbs up. Yeah. Mm. Can you point out where you are in this picture? Uh, yeah. Uh, sort of yeah. Thinner version of me. Um, <laughs> Which I, I, know, I was there. I am. She really can't see very well, but I'm walking in there with a with a pad of pad of paper with a with a pig drawn on it. That's my then girlfriend with her then. What do you call that thing again when you frizz the hair? Uh, yeah. No. Um, she's now now my wife, Karina, but uh, she looks a little different. My sister is here. Uh, one of my sisters, Yvonne. She has her computer paper because. You see, the, it was the old-fashioned computer paper, that kind of light, light mm -hmm. blue stripe thing, all that folded stuff. Because she had a um, she had a, a PC in, in 1983, which not everybody had, and she had the the security police knew that she had the, the whole database for the Claremont and some of the OBS UDF people, so they were kind of going for her. And they, they actually, when they detained her, that's what they were looking for. Um, and there are various other people there who, who... There's one on the roof that I don't think we can see that has a special tail hanging by. Where is yeah, it? Uh, yes, that one. and that's my namesake. Yeah. That's Jojo Shapiro. Does anybody here remember Jojo Shapiro? There may be some people who know. Uh, uh, all the, he was very well known in Cape Town, not so much out of it, but he was in the same... I mean, it was funny, Jonathan, two Jonathan Shapiro's in this little UDF branch, um, names spelled the same and everything, uh, almost the same age. He was a lot wilder than me, he's got wild, wild hair, which you can't see yet at the table. And he's the guy lassoing, yeah, there you go, he's lassoing the helicopter. Um, I mean, he actually once, uh, when he saw that the cops were videoing a, 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 a protest, he actually went to the cop van, I mean, he's, he was completely crazy, and he actually tried to break the windscreen with his fist and succeeded in breaking his fist. And, and then he got shot in the eye with 
it's, you know, he had a hell of a day. He, he, they saved his eyesight then. But he, unfortunately, he died um, a couple of years ago. But uh, the, the thing was, when I eventually got detained uh, in 1980, the cops came immediately, the, the security police came around in, in 19, uh, the beginning of 87 when this, when this was published. And they came looking for me and for the calendar. And I wasn't around, and, and I got a kind of coded message saying, don't come home. So I went into hiding, and I, I dyed my hair, and it went orange by mistake. And it was, it was, well, my wife always says that it was, she knew it would go orange at first, I then she dyed it blonde, and, and then I had little granny glasses. And what. But I couldn't stay in hiding for very long. Eventually I came out of hiding, but it was a year and a half later the cops got me. Uh, they came one night, the usual sort of story, three, three in the morning, and they took me to Polsma, and in Polsma, uh, then my first, in my first interrogation, I mean, this thing came up in two different ways. Was, this, this, well, no, this was 80, 87, the duty of 87, so I did it at the end of 86. In the first interrogation, the, they, they said to me, uh, the, the main interrogator said, why do you draw us as pigs? So I said, I draw what I see. <laughs> I did say that. No, they did put me in, in solitary after that, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't for that reason. Uh, it was because I wasn't telling other stuff. But I realized from the questions they were asking me that they actually had, they thought I was on the Mandela Birthday Committee. Because remember, that was for the organizing, 88 when I got detained, they were organizing for the big, the big birthday in the Wembley Stadium over here. And I realized that Jojo was on that committee. So then I, then I went to study, and I was away for two years, two and a half years. When I came back, I went to a party in Oz, and there was, there was Jojo, and I said, Hey, Jojo, you know that when they detained me, it was because they thought I was you. So he would be set no shit. He said, Well, you were away, they detained me because I, they thought I was you. <laughs> I was like, okay, we quit. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that was a, that uh, I was I was trying to find that I, I've been frustrated in that ambition, and because I wanted to stay out of the army, I went to the, I went to, to I went to university, and eventually I couldn't stay out of the army. Did you and draw in the army, and did you draw in prison? Did they allow yeah. you? Yeah. No, they didn't allow me. I smuggled stuff in in my I smuggled stuff in the bottom of my bag, and they didn't search every part of my bag. Um, I had a little small bag, but I had quite a wad of paper in there. And eventually I smuggled it out of my underpants. <laughs> so they were obviously they didn't regard me as a hell of a threat because they weren't, they had no strip searches underpants, and stuff. Underpants, underpants, bulging. <laughs> 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 your would see right, in the right way, with papers. Uh, I want to know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not only the bulging, carpets, uh, things are right under, uh, bulging closets full of skeletons and bulging uh, waste packet baskets full of uh, uh, rhubarb, rhubarb and so forth. Um, I want to know what, what form did uh, your political resistance take in the army? Well, I mean, when I, I mean, I went in, I had sort of three weeks to decide whether or not to go in. I mean, again, there must be people in this room who had that decision to make. And then you were going to either leave the country or go to go to jail and very few of us actually did go to jail or, or you know go to the army and just try and keep your head down or go to the army and do make some little protest which is what i did so i went there and i, I immediately went to the first guys with sort of grass on their shoulders i had no idea what they were called um, and i said to them, look i'm new here but i'm i'm not prepared to carry a gun what do i do so they were they they kind of they said uh, you'll know about it when the time comes and every time I said this to more and more junior people, and the more junior they were, the more pissed off they got. And eventually, you know, they, let, they sort of set the corporals on me. And then I, I spent six, seven weeks being harassed, being identified as kind of camp communist. Not that I was at that stage connected to any organization, but I was, I was singled out. That was their technique. And uh, there, I was one out of 700 who was doing it for political reasons. There were another three people who were Christians, like a Plymouth Brethren, a Jehovah's Witness, and a Christadelphian. I still remember. And um, 
But I, so they kind of regard them as just slack men, so. But me, they regarded as a real fail cut, so. <laughs> so then, no, then, by the way, they gave me a, a, eventually a lead pole to carry. A lead pole? A lead pole. So I had this lead pole. Oh, well, a, a le they, 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 the, one, one afternoon, my, event, my lieutenant got so cut for with just with my getting into trouble with all the other corporals and lieutenants in the whole place that he spent his Sunday afternoon making me this ridiculous thing, the lead pole, which was just a bit heavier than a normal rifle, not much, and then attached to a piece of wood with, with nails and wire, a really funny thing. And I, I eventually would stand on the, on the parade ground with this thing. And, and in hot weather, which it was up in Pretoria, then if we had, they'd come and suddenly they'd shout, and you, you, you lift this thing and it would fall apart. So I'd be like, I would be like, so putting it together again. Everyone's standing, you remember in the life of Brian when they're all going like, <laughs> and the centurion's having a hard time. So all the, eventually it became a complete joke. But before that happened, a really dumb corporal made me go, made me stand guard with this thing. And I said to him, corporal, this is what I have. You realize that you can't let me stand guard with this. And he said, okay, start off with your peloton. So I said, okay, it's your responsibility. And I stood guard, and I, it was the best double takes I've ever seen. And you were filming like how a double take should work for a movie. It's these generals and colonels driving home on Sunday afternoon, and they drive, they see you, oh, yeah, stay stand right there, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the next morning, all hell broke loose, and I was taken to the, the, the colonel's office, the, the head of the camp, and he said, "Who started busting the party?" And I said, "I said, uh, uh, Colonel, it was uh, that corporal. Bring me that boy." <laughs> I stood there while he got in the car for about 10 minutes and he got three extra duties and he said to me, he said, Nim the back and then I will not need your singing. So I just took it out for the, uh, in, a, in a black garbage bag. All the, as I went out there, all kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so that was then, I kept it, I still got it. <laughs> Yeah, of course it was fine. <laughs> no, not, not all the harassment. The first six weeks, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't funny. I nearly broke down a couple of times, I have to be honest. But, uh, but those things, that thing, all that stuff, that was very easy. <laughs> well, I'm prepared now to ask you about the previous from Bangladesh. Yeah. Because you have been involved in the Bangladesh Army since 1980. What happened to you in New York when you went to study there? You just studied architecture. Four years of it. Uh, if I have to be really honest, five. But I, I failed a semester and I pulled out of a semester, which shows you that I wasn't completely you know, and then doing the right thing. You first went to Brussels to the Tintin Museum. Yeah, when I was in my... In architectural there? fourth year. Because uh, um, I was still studying a six-year degree. That was the idea. So I went to to do this degree and to stay out of the army and and I wasn't completely focused but I, I did love some aspects of it and perspective drawing and all that. In your fourth year they encourage you to travel if you can. So I worked for a while because for a film in town and then I then I went traveling and my, by that time I realized that I wanted to go and test myself and see could I actually I'd make this commitment to become a cartoonist, also knowing that it could, it could result in my getting pulled into the army. And so I went to, to Brussels to meet Hege, who was the, the Tintin artist and writer. And I wish I could tell you that I met him. I, I went unannounced to his studio, and um, they were hell of a nice to me. His, his main collaborator, um, Bob de Moore, was there, and, and a number of other people. And they said, you missed him, he was here yesterday because he wasn't coming in very often, he was quite ill. And I was very disappointed, but they were fantastic. They showed me around. It was incredibly inspirational. And they gave me some stuff which I still got. And then I went to meet uh, um, Udizo, who's uh, the artist of Astrid. He should have stayed, by the way. Speaking as somebody who writes a little bit of poetry, a little bit of doggerel, and, a little, and does a lot of drawing, some people are just great at drawing. And that's what he, the, the first like 23 Astrid's books are brilliant. And then the next ones are crap. And, because he's written them himself. But he's the most fantastic artist, and he was really nice to me as well. I arrived at his house at 11 o'clock at night. 
and announced as well. <laughs> Quite a mistake. I, I was in Paris, I was the only time I waited at the doorbell. Like, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? Eventually I rang the doorbell. And he was still dressed, and thank goodness, and he was fantastic. And his, and his daughter came home right at that moment. I actually said, I'm, I'm Jonathan Shapiro, I'm, 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 a, I'm trying to become a cartoonist, and I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, and I love your work, and terribly sorry to come so late, but I got lost. And he said, on track. And I realized he couldn't speak a word of English. <laughs> so, and then his wife came down this very grand staircase. She was also still dressed, thank God. And then, and like there's this awkward thing, and he says, uh, Zona, I freaked the suit. Like, da, 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 da. He said a couple of things and he really, that he understood. And then his daughter walks in from outside. She'd been out, she was studying English at the Sorbonne. Oh. So thank, thank goodness it all worked out nicely. And he said, oh, thank you. Yeah, okay. And he looked at my drawings. And uh, it, was, it was quite an amazing. That was a turning point. It was. Because it, I, just thought, I, I just thought those two experiences, just, I, I said to myself, look, I'm either going to stay in architecture and something that I could eventually, I was starting to do a little bit better. So either I'm going to, you know, I can do OK, I can become a, a <coughs> professional, I can, you know, I can do OK. Or I can go and do what I really want and take a risk and maybe, and, and yeah, immediately I got into trouble and, 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 but it was worth it. Because let's have the union buildings. <laughs> That's it, by the way. Yada yada, safe for sex, yada yada, condomize, yada yada. Uh, yeah, you can read better than I can, so. But it's all yada yada. yada. What I want to say, just that interjection. This architecture business, you, you noted that you found uh, perspective drawing interesting during the studies, and so one could see the, the impact on the architecture. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended, but just wanting to refer to the, to the devices that you use. You use a lot of architectural device to frame up um, situations and to frame up um, you know, events yeah. and so on. Lots of buildings. No, no absolutely. I mean, the, I think the most important thing that I learned, apart from perspective drawing and, and stuff, the most important thing I learned from Six architecture was, was, was about seeing things in metaphor. Because we, in fact, had one lecturer in architecture, uh, a guy called Paul Ruggini, um, who was, who was very, he was a hell of a good teacher. And that was, that was the one thing that he helped us. He would say, okay, now you're going to go and do this assignment in our, in our third year, when I started to actually focus on architecture and think maybe there is something in this, uh, before I kind of bailed out. But I, he said, you know, go, and do, go and design a building as a gateway, or go and design a building as a crawl, or go, and, and those, for me, that was very powerful. And so that was the one, the most important thing, I think. And then the actual perspective drawing, and using architectural devices with the other, exactly as you, as you say, those are the things that I run out of it. And, and, I, and I do, I am grateful for that. But there are also other kinds of gadgets. And uh, you like gadgets. You like uh, putting a, a propeller on a, on a scooter bike and putting a baby on it. You like to design odd little machines. <laughs> Could you say something about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think I often think that in verbal or in, um, in, in verbal or in visual parody, you have to do something that is actually convincing, that's convincingly like the thing that you're parodying, that, that it actually feels as if it has a, a has substance and form and could actually work. And then and then you then then, then the device right, that you add to that to to make that kind of conceptual shift yeah. is is going to work and is going to be funny or have that little chemical reaction in the brain which says, you know, laugh or see it in a different way. Let's have that brain. Oh, you, you have Bush's a... Bush's brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes some, you know, reality just hands you something. I mean... I don't know if you remember, but I mean, it was actually reported in the newspapers that, that President Bush was, had a colonoscopy. And I thought, no, that is too bloody good to me. I've got to figure out how to use it. But, it, you know, it seems, sometimes it, 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 
something like this is so simple that you think that it actually comes immediately, but it doesn't doesn't necessarily. I try to try to think of what could happen. Eventually, I suddenly realized, and what you know, to tap into that kind of global distaste for him and what he was doing and for that right wing agenda and all of that and that sort of boneheadedness. And and I suddenly thought, well, just imagine. And it was really like it wasn't. It was one of those light bulb moments. Which, and this is the, you know, I, I went to speak at the World Economic Forum to take part um, and try not to get co-opted for four, four, years in, four years in a row uh, and went along there. And it was quite a surreal experience of speaking to heads of corporations and heads of government and, you know, they're sitting in an in in a, in a auditorium like this, even smaller. And you, you have, it's a real global mega, I don't want to say mega stars, the mega important people. And, and this was the most popular cartoon I showed them. I just said, it went down everywhere really, really well. <laughs> so you don't have to necessarily be that terrible. But it was, but it was about... Sorry about that. I don't, I, I mean, I've never said that before. But it's, but it's in a sense, it's tapping into something that... That's, it was tapping into something that actually really, it really touched a lot of people. <laughs> I think you have these little lip forms, you see, and there is a relapse here. And one often sees in your in your work this characterization, a short characterization. Either it's a lip yeah. or it's a, the, the eyes, Zuma's eyes, or it's um, uh, Obama's very long sort of uh, yeah, the chin. chin. There, there. But well, funny enough, George Bush, I, I've always noticed the similarity of the way, I don't know, I mean, if you look at George Bush and you look at uh, Robert Mugabe, they don't look the same. But in, there's somehow the way that my, there was something about the, the Bush and Mugabe. The, the, I don't know, in the cartoons, they started to have this, this similar kind of feeling, which I have deliberately tapped into. Right? <laughs> I do, yeah. I, I, Nose is very central. So if you're going to draw, let's say you're going to draw a distorted mouth uh, or, or distorted eyes or something, you, you may just want to kind of situate the nose somewhere and then you, then depending on the person, you might go for the eyes and then the mouth or the mouth and then the eyes and then go around. But I, I, often when I'm doing quick caricatures, I start with the nose, yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to know, when one looks at your work, is this, this very prolific output. And uh, uh, I read somewhere that you wake up in the morning, you're half asleep, you plug into the radio and you start listening. So I, I want to know, I want you to describe to us a day in the life of Jonathan Shapiro. Uh, how, how do you keep it up? And how do you keep so well, right? How do you stay so good humor to your daughter? I don't know, maybe I'm getting very How do you know? How do you know I stay good? <laughs> I don't. I, I, I tell you, there, there are times when. I mean, the, the deadlines, I, I, that, I have to be completely honest, the deadlines really get to me. The deadlines get to me. And there are days when I, I, I wanted my, I had, we had to look for a house where there was a studio separate from the house so that my mayhem doesn't sort of pollute the house. In, in full plate, I've got to have a place by myself where I can be a maniac and shout to myself. Is your wife firm about keeping your mayhem yeah, 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 and with, with good reason. I mean, when, when I had, we in our previous house, um, actually, funny enough, Anki, is, is Anki here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, he's there. Yeah, uh, we, we moved into this, uh, uh, we moved into a house in, in, uh, in De Laurent Street in, in Tamsburg, the lower Tamsburg, upper gardens, whatever. And then I suddenly heard that Anki was moving in next door. And so we were neighbors there. And then in that house, <laughs> Uh, my studio was not. My studio was 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 in the house, and it's there's a there's a mania that kind of that that's from those deadlines. I'll tell you which I didn't like. I didn't like being in the house, and then so we looked for a new house. We found this house. It's, yeah, it's pretty much it's above ground. Um, it's not like soundproof. Or, it's above ground. You know, it's, it, there's a nice little patch of lawn there that keeps me sane and a tree and things. But but it's um, but it is separate from the house, and we we found this house, and then suddenly we heard that Ike was moving now across the road. 
<laughs> she's in the house. And I can see it there, her house, my house. Again, very, very funny. Maybe this could be a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't know. What would I do? I don't know. Two variations of, uh, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> No, no, she's much, she's not like me. <laughs> she will show us later tonight. She might say she is. What she's like. I want to know now from you, what happens to you uh, if at 3 o'clock in the afternoon uh, you don't have something? Uh, 3 o'clock's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot worse than that, I can assure you. So first you harvest the newspaper and uh, the radio, and to get a seat of the day, yeah, no, I have a friend who's, who, the, the thing you might have read was that I went to stay with a friend in Durban, and but it's not the same in, whether I'm in Durban or at home. I've got this little miniature radio. I'm the only person who still looks for a radio that doesn't have anything else on it. No MP3s and no phone, no, no, just a little tiny radio, AM and FM. And, um, and I just trawl around in this thing, and yeah, he said I'd take my news intravenously. So, and then, but that's what I start with that, and then, while I'm preparing the, the kids, to, you know, to go to school, then I'm listening to the radio, and I'm, you know, and then I start, and I take them, and I, you know, I'm reading the newspaper, then I'm doing admin, and trying to think of ideas, and getting sort of trying to fend off people, and um, I have somebody to help me fend off people. But there, there's a lot. The thing, what I'm grateful for is that the cartoons evoke so much response. What's difficult is that I don't know how to deal with it all. I just, I really don't. So often, I, by, the, by the afternoon, because of all these different things that I'm involved in, it's, I'm, I'm kind of not quite there. And then I, I really push things. And that's, that's been the most difficult thing yeah, forever, for the last 25 years. So now you also have a process that you go through when you draw. You have a little sketch. Though. Yeah. Okay, little sketch and then? Well, not a little sketch, actually. I, I don't, I start verbally. I, 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 li I there's hardly ever been a time when I, I'm watching TV and I suddenly get an idea for a drawing. It doesn't look like it. Absolutely. I, I even write subjects. I mean, it's, I, I actually write down, uh, I write down uh, Julian Assange, uh, Ecuador, you know, Ecuador, Britain, uh, asylum, whatever, like that kind of stuff. A word map. Yeah, and then I'll put down something about the, the mine, the, the mine is killed and then I'll do it. There's some of those things don't even have anything to do with each other, and I can't think of it. But every now and then I put down those words, something just, I suddenly say, hang on, Mars, Mars, and uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, um, Zimbabwe or something, you link those two. Um, uh, and that's happened before. I mean, that, that, that's a natural question. So, you allow quite a lot of funny accidents to happen yeah. between words and associations. Absolutely. It's, a, it's like a free association thing for a while, and then. Do you have to smoke or drink or do things for that stuff to get in? Because sometimes if one focuses on it directly, it doesn't come. Like, coffee is my only drug of, like, my, not my only drug of. So you should use your word map and suddenly something sparks off. Yeah, I mean, I drink lots of cups of coffee and I'm, I'm busy uh, doing the word map stuff. And then, then the little ideas, then the little drawings start all around the page. And then... Then I, I start linking, the, linking them and, and doing little tiny sketches, trying to do lots of different ones. And eventually I start seeing two or three of them that may be working and then try, I'm sometimes trying three of them at once. And then eventually I you choose one. You choose one. You have to create a lot of compost yeah. before you find a Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, um, then I, I'm teaching my students that uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you create a lot of mess and then you find Something and it's plugged in, first in your way up, so you half sleep, so subconsciously away. And then, what do you, what do you do uh, to proceed from that final first one? Uh, sometimes I just put a, I just put a little piece of layout pad over one that looks good, and I, and then I actually sometimes develop a cartoon at about, gee, smaller than A5, maybe something like that. And then with that cartoon, if it looks good, I'll blow that up on a photostat machine and I'll put my card, I'll put that onto a light box. I had a light box design, which is a, sort of a drawing 
my old architectural drawing table and the light box together. I don't know, I think it's going to be incredibly boring for anyone who's, who doesn't do drawing, but it's, it's a fantastic little machine which a friend of mine did made for me. And, and I stick it on there and then I start, I may do a little more penciling and then I start inking. Yeah. And what is the strangest place where you finish the uh, on one of, well, strangest place I suppose the most difficult is drawing with dipping pen and ink in an aeroplane in the, in the window seat. Um, like, because occasionally I'm stupid enough to actually decide I want to do it my old style dipping pen and ink thing. So I've got to make sure that the person next to me is not huge or is absent or knows that if they bump me, they die. <laughs> or whatever. But no, no, they've all been, people are actually quite fascinated. But I, 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 I use, I've used the aeroplane window as a light, as a light box. So I, I have my little rough drawing and I stick that up on the aeroplane window. So I try and get a window seat for that and then I draw it on, but it can only fit half the drawing. So I have to move it. And then I stick it down on the thing and, you know, and it, that's, that's hectic when you have to wait for sometimes there's bumps and things. So that's difficult. <laughs> I also drew a cartoon almost complete. I just put the words in later on in a taxi on the way from, no, it was not in a taxi, it was a friend driver on the way from, from a small town into Paris. Uh, once, that was, that was quite a, a, I was very happy with that. And you know, a few, few things like that. Yeah. Okay, the life of a cartoonist, because the deadline is a deadline. Now, I have a whole list of things here. Our, our time is, uh, is running out, and I have to get to a lot still. You have published 17 cartoon collections. And you've exhibited internationally, and you have two honorary doctors. And you have a lot of awards here. The Klaus Award from the Netherlands, uh, a Courage in Cartooning Award from the America-based Cartoonist Rights Network International. You have a Press Freedom Award from the Media Institute of South Africa. You have a Mondi Shandukwa Newspaper Award for Editorial Cartoons. And so it goes on. And I want to get into the heavy stuff. This is a, a quite an impressive list of acknowledgements from a wide range of institutions. One of your honorary degrees comes from the old University of Transcant. Is that right? Yeah, just before they became off the That's right. What, what year was it in Nitra? <coughs> 2004. 2004. Who else were at that uh, at that uh, uh, well, there was Adelaide Tambo, um, Ali Mazrui, um, um, Nokazola Magida, not that many people have heard of it, she's an Eastern Cape uh, uh, activist. Um, um, oh, I'm just blanking on his name for a second. Famous, famous writer. Uh, um, um, no, 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 no. Uh, on the spot now for a second, I can't think. But I will. Um, um, I will in a second. And uh, the Diva. Well, that was, it was, that was, you know, it was all these amazing people. And then, and then they said, you're getting it along with the Diva. And I said, you know, come again. And it turned out that he, the, the, so we went out to try and be at his ceremony. And then we actually were going on a family holiday beforehand and we were out here in the Drakensberg, we got this call to say there's been a change of plans. Madiba is no longer accepting these things in person. He's not coming along to the university because this was just at the time, the end of the time he was doing it. And, uh, and the, the, the university is coming to Madiba. They're going to his house. So if you want to be there, you've got to drive like hell. So we, the family got in the car and drove like hell got there in time and there was an actual ceremony at his house in Kunu, which was amazing. They sort of shoved an academic gown on me before I got my degree. So I was sort of a fake degree person for a while. And then just so I could get into the thing and be on the stage with the convocation and it was an incredible event. Yeah. Um, the speech you made uh, when you received the Rose Honorary <coughs> on the internet for everybody to read, but can you remember what you said? Did you have time to speak at the Walter Sulu University? Uh, the, the Walter Sulu or the, or the, the, the Rhodes? The Kroonu. Yeah. 
Gee, I, 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 I remember. Um, I mean, I, I don't remember the exact, yeah. the exact, but I talked about this, this, um, this incredible period of, of shifting from, from drawing cartoons, satirizing the, the old order, and attacking the old order, and being an activist doing that to this difficult transition that I mean that we all have to make, and uh, and what it was like then, and then, and then through. You know, starting to really take on the, 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 the new order and finding it really very gratifying that people were supportive of that. So, not, not necessarily, in time, but no, some of them are. What I want to get to is exactly this point. Um, I was I remember, the, I remember when that was publicised and all the stuff around it. I, I think that's nonsense. I, I think that, um, I think, I mean, at the same time, I have done cartoons and I will still do cartoons and I will still say publicly, uh, saying that um, that whites have not taken proper responsibility for what happened in apartheid, and that everyone from from the clerk to whites as a whole, that doesn't mean individuals, I mean whites as a, as, a, as a group, and I also think that there should be things like, I mean, I think it would be important to have things like wealth tax that people have been talking about a long time. I think there's a hell of a lot that people must look at, myself included, everybody, and, and I, I often try and look at myself and see, am I being a hypocrite and espousing certain positions but actually benefiting from things and, and sometimes I, I don't even know how to reconcile what I do see as the hypocrisy because it is really complex and it's difficult. Yeah. But the one thing that I would say that, that would, would be the wrong response to, to all of, of that indecision and all of that, uh, that angst yeah. would be to just shut up and, and, and kind of roll over and not be critical and not take part. If you do, if you do that then you're actually not Taking part as a as a real member of the society, you're 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 something else. You're either patronising or you're bottling up what you really feel, or you're just actually not not really doing, not really taking part. I think you have to be you have to continue to 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 be true to what you really feel. And one must have the skin then to take what comes at once. If you if you do what you feel, like you know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the, the, what is interesting still to me is how uh, I, I went to a cartoon which showed how there were three different panels, and the one person was saying something about Zimbabwe, and then something about Palestine, and the next one was saying something about Palestine, and, and, and something about something else. So I can't remember the exact sequence, but he, there was a, they, they kind of got linked. They got looped, and the, the first one went back to the beginning, and at the bottom it, it, it was something to the effect that. Uh, as South Africans, we all we, 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 must, we all have to maintain our double. We, we all have double standards to maintain. And essentially, there's the, the, the line. I mean, I constantly get a situation where I do something about, as a Jew, cr really savaging Israel and or, or, or South African Jewish uh, uncritical support for Israel, and I get slammed for it by fellow Jews, and I get praised for it by some other people, including some Muslims. Then I'll then I'll do another I'll do Prophet Muhammad. And then, then they'll say, now you've crossed the line. And I say, yeah, yesterday you thought I should cross the line. And then, and then, and then it, everybody's got a different line that you shouldn't cross. Mm. So I said, no, no, no. You know, that as if you, in whatever field you are, whether it's cartoon or you know, poetry, literature, anything, you, you actually have to, you have to, 
be able to cross those lines and say, oh, that's where I'm going to go. If you have to delineate for us the, the normative constraints that you think are necessary, what are those constraints? This is kind of a sticky question because one doesn't always necessarily have to know that in a sort of a philosophical form. But, I mean, it would be wrong if people would, would label you as a liberal. You have sort of more socialist-leaning economic kind of views. And it would be wrong to say, you know, it would be right probably or wouldn't it to say that you have a, a basic humanistic point of view. What kind of tradition of humanism would you sort of link yourself to? Mm -hmm. How would you, where would you sort of say that you plug in as far as the political questions of values are concerned? I mean, that's so many different strands. I can't sort of, I can't just say one one yeah. thing. But I, that my political uh, sort of back, my political schooling yeah. came quite late. Yeah. It came after varsity. I mean, at varsity, I was kind of wafting around in a cloud of sort of no, no sleep and dacha and what, whatever. <laughs> but not, I, not that I was a, a heavy smoker. I wasn't. But I, you know, it was just, I just really didn't know where, I, I kind of knew where my heart lay politically, but nothing really happened. And, and it really was during the UDF period. That, so it's that on the ground thing, wasn't it what particularly academic? No. Uh, that's, that's one thing I'm not. And I, I have a smattering of everything. I've just done, but not, I don't have a hell of a, a strong academic background. I don't have a, I don't, I never got politically uh, t taught at varsity. It was all picking up bits and pieces of journalism, politics, humanism, and you, and you had a, books. a core group of people who sort of shaped you politically, that you kept contact with for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, look, and, and I still, I still sometimes do. I still sometimes phone them. Although I noticed there was one cartoon that you were, you were. I don't know if that's going to go up no, just now. The, the the cult of Zuma. Okay. Is that yeah? Yes, the cult of Zuma. No, I mean, there's somebody that I shame. I, I shouldn't. Now I've already started. I can't kind of just uh, uh, pretend that I haven't said anything. But um, I mean, I was, I was, I, I savaged Willie Hoffman a couple of times. Um, he's somebody who's a, a friend of mine. Oh, there he is. And you see, this is these are the, all the people in front who are having their their, their heads, their, their brains washed by the shower. And Willie, Willie's the second one. He's he's actually the one getting the jet right there and because you know he helped facilitate that. The, what happened that when the, when those charges got dropped again, the the the, the, charge, the Zuma corruption charges, he helped facilitate it. I mean, Willie's an amazing guy. He doesn't have a corrupt bone in his body, but he, but he helped that process. And I did two cartoons where I really went for him. And, and I spoke to him afterwards. And I mean, he was, well, he, he spoke to me. And uh, he was, I mean, I'll tell you, he was very upset. He was very, very upset. And, and there are people like that. Occasionally people, I, I will speak to them and ask them advice and things. But I'm also, on certain occasions, have to, I just feel I've got to go for them. So there's a very strange relationship that I have with some of those people who I regard as mentors, who are people who I'm now like really chiding, and it happens, in, you know, every now and then. Who do you feel you are addressing at the moment with your cartoons? Has the, the, the audience that you're addressing yourself to has it shifted? in any marked way, if you can say, look, from the day I drew Mandela smiling and announcing the new day, and I was uh, addressing a whole range of people, South African complete spectrum, that was when we were united against the common enemy. And how has that audience changed now? It's and how quite, it's it quite, feel? Uh, it, it, it feels sad that I think there is a there is a shift, um, but but every now and then I'm kind of jolted into realizing that the shift may not be as bad as I thought. Because I mean, when I when I when I went to the Soweto and the Man and Guardian in 1994, or well, I first the Man and Guardian in early 94 and the Soweto in mid 94, I was had I, I had these two very disparate readerships, 
And at that stage, the Mono Guardian was predominantly white and predominantly very, you know, much more educated than most newspapers uh, readership. And the, the Sowetan was sort of 98, 97, 98 percent black in those days. And I loved doing cartoons in the Sowetan where I just felt I was able to tap into something that was just different from any other newspaper I'd worked in. And I really got into it, and I didn't, and I made it my, I really made a, an effort not to, not to try and kind of change any politics for either newspaper, but just to, sometimes, sometimes I tapped into different metaphors that kind of worked very nicely. And, and the most fantastic thing for me was for that first literally six, seven years, if I ever went to Joburg and people, and I met people who read the Sowetan, they would like, ow. That's the you. And, and they said, I thought you were a black guy. And I loved that because I thought I was tapping into something that I could not have, I mean, if that, that response was, would not have been the same if they could see that there was a, there was, you know. Yeah. And, and, well, I thought that things had changed a lot and maybe they have because there's certain people who really, I, I mean, I do, I do find that there's a, there is sometimes a racial polarization which I, I hate that I'm sometimes becoming part of because of the way politics has become so bitter. But it's not just a racial thing. I mean, you see the kind of words that are used by, like, in amongst, say, black people calling black people something or, um, or whatever, diff diff the, the kinds of things that, like, uh, Terry Lakota, you know, at the heart of the ANC at some point, and then can get called anything from a snake to whatever. So that can, that can happen to me. But last, just, just a few months ago, I went up to Joburg and I had one of those experiences again. There's some guy who absolutely loved my work. I was sitting with one of my editors, and the bar, uh, the, the the waiter, was he'd been serving us all evening, and then the, the editor, just for fun, he said, "You know who this guy is," and he said he's a pirate. And the waiter, I'm serious, the guy, he went, he like had like a physical shock, and he, he went, <gasps> and he just disappeared. He ran away, <laughs> and then he like he came back again, and he said, he's. And it was the most incredible thing. And he, he had followed my work for years and years and years. And somehow or other, he missed seeing all the vitriol against me as a whitey or whatever it was. But yeah, so, so there's, yeah. there's still, some of those things still happen. I still think that maybe I am still tapping into stuff every now and then. You, you don't uh, get approached sometimes by uh, right-wing white people who want to appreciate your work. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a hypothetical question? <laughs> Of course. Oh my God! I mean, they don't approach me usually. They, they don't. They, they just. They just take my stuff and put like they'll take they'll cherry pick ten ten cartoons. You know, which you if you go through the books, you can cherry pick ten that that could work very well in a right wing pamphlet. And even though I'm not right wing, obviously, but you if you you know you just edit out like the nine others and you take every tenth one. And you say, oh, that one will work, and that one, that Mugabe one, that Zuma one, that Malema one, and this one about crime, and this one. I find my stuff on hate sites, these disgusting, vile, right-wing hate sites. There's nothing I can do about it. You can't, you can't find out who these people are, where they are, and you can't get it off. I don't know how to do it. If anyone has any ideas, please tell me. But it's horrible. <coughs> I still admire the pluck you have, the resilience you have to just sort of bear with this because I find it very difficult. I'm one of those who go and hide because I find it too difficult, this place is too difficult for me. Maybe is that true? I don't think that's true. I want to know what would be your, your um, advice or message today to a young cartoonists who's, who's starting today? Sort of, uh, uh, I mean, the only thing that I tell when, when, when there are, I mean, that when I do meet young cartoonists or people who would like to be cartoonists, the one thing I always say is just be, the main thing is be passionate about what's going on around you. That, that's, that's the cover all thing. Obviously, there's the politics, you hope that the person is going to develop into a kind of a right winger or whatever, whether it's a 
a, a white person, a black person, whatever. You, th th there's a whole lot of other stuff that you can get kind of political such from different different sources. But just being passionate about what's going on. If you, you're passionate about what's going on, you're passionate about trying to find ways to communicate that. That that's that's the simple thing. And there's a hell of a lot more about the drawing and the politics and all that that I thought. Right. Are people bored? No. I don't no. think so. I was going to go on a little bit. Is that all right with everybody? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sit down, I suppose. I've kind of walked up a little bit. I just, but before we do, I, just, I mean, I, what I haven't actually said is I just, I just want to say now because maybe I won't get another chance of, is, is one incredible honor. That's why, why I was, was, was sort of nervous at the beginning. Was just, uh, it's an incredible honor that to have my work looked on, looked at, examined, and used in this, in this way. It's a first, it's a first for me, and it's, it's absolutely, it's brilliant, and I, I mean, I hope that I can get you know all the stuff, uh, like audio and written, eventually, because it's it's really great. Thank you, thank you, thank you all who, who did it, all the poets. Yeah. So do you have a guitar? Or are you no, no, I, I don't. I don't play a guitar. I I play a mouth organ, but I find it hard to play a mouth organ and sing at the same time. There is a text, but I don't know. Uh, gee. Oh, I can't even read that. I, I, I haven't even looked at this for... I did sing it at the Baxter. Uh, uh, Evita invited me on the stage and I sang it, the, uh, I think it was the night before, or two nights before the election. Uh, I, I really can't read it. I'm not get, oh, there we go. I went down to the polling station to make my mark, but I couldn't go inside. Got stuck in the car park. I voted without hesitation. ANC since 94. But now they've lost the plot, can't vote for them no more. Oh, I'm an undecided voter, blue as I can be. Goddamn ballot box blues, just can't vote ANC. I came out of the struggle, I was on the left. I was a struggleista in the UDF. When the clerk released Mandela, we were all set free. I was on the road of freedom with the ANC. I don't know where I'm going with that one. But that is paranoia, it's denial and arms deal. Uh, oh, all around his, oh, allowed, I can't read it. Allowed his, thank you. Allowed his, his carters and his cronies to lie, cheat and steal. Becky had to go, our political tumor. I'm glad he was replaced, but why the fuck with Zuma? <laughs> Maya Helen Zilla. I think I had a better tune when I went there. I admire Helen Zilla, but don't want to vote the A. The UDM's Halamisa has some good things to say. Patricia the Lily is feisty, but her ID's not much hope. There's no perfect opposition. Damn, I just can't go. I'm an undecided voter, lost faith in the ANC. Struggle is just black and white, are blue as we can be. Before. I don't mean, know where the heck I was now, but anyway, you get the gist. Thank you. I have thus far uh, not heeded the typical Stellenbosch injunction to be a neutral and balanced interviewer. <laughs> I sit here with a master of the, the partisan mode. But one who can undercut these partisan clarities with pointers to the vast complexities of our situation. And one who tints his judgments with warmth and empathy when the occasion asks for it. And one who can let rip with outrageously funny and subversive analysis the actions and behavior of those in power, not sparing any of them a single <coughs> bulging tummy, eyelid, pocket, or member. The bulge we know is the salt of caricature. Peter Cannon's a bulge grave. <laughs> <laughs> the only member still standing up for it. I think maybe the guy. Jerusalem 
and of the holy trinity of dignity, respect, and balance, incurred the wrath of the current head of state, who is also a priest. And this priest is at the moment suing Zapiru and his co-accused newspaper to the tune of what? Uh, there are two, two lawsuits, but the one we're not hearing much about. The one that started at 15 million, yeah. which was a world record, um, <laughs> not that I means anything, because nobody ever gets awarded of those damages. That, that one has now been reduced to 10 million and then to 2 million. And that was for three cartoons during his rape trial. And, but it's still there, but it's 2 million. The, the other one which they are going for, and which may actually, they, they take the, the, date, the court date is October this year, is for the Lady Justice cartoon. It's a much more serious case, and that one is, uh, it started at 7 million, it's now at 5 million. Well, I would like, uh, in my personal capacity, I don't speak for the university, but I would say, you have my support, my heartfelt support for this thing that's now hitting you, and I wish you all the best for that date in October, when you have to go and face those people. I hope the lawyers shred them, your lawyers. <laughs> Thank you, and I know they will. We have the best, uh, the best freedom of expression attorneys in the business. Um, fantastic. And, and it's, well, I'll tell you that if it, I mean, it's Dario Milo uh, with Web of, Web of Ansel, absolutely brilliant. And they've briefed from Trengrove. So, I mean, if, if, if what happened with the spear in court is anything to go by, uh, we'd be in, in for some fireworks. And, and I'll just tell you that the essence of that case, the essence of that case, if it does go ahead, would be, was I justified in using such a strong metaphor to actually say that the person who was trying to become president was abusing, along with other people, and threatening and, and intimidating the judiciary in order to get the corruption charges dropped against him. It's as simple as that. And if they want to see that stuff dragged up in court by Vim Trengro, <laughs> then good luck to them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is what happened later. Um, the oh, that's the second one. Uh, that's that's the second one. You have to kind of see the first one. The first one is, yeah, no, it's, it's a very different cartoon. Do you have the first one or not? Even though it looks the same. <laughs> Basically, it's, yeah, it, it comes across so differently, I can't even describe the difference. It's <laughs> uh, it's, it's in amongst my ones, I've got it in, in the other. Oh, there it is, okay, that's the second one, there's the first one. Oops. If you've got my ones on there, it's, it's uh, a bit, it's, it, okay. it, it is amongst those. But anyway. okay. Well, we'll get it now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these, these are all going to be really huge, which is interesting, and cut off. So you'll just get like bits and pieces. Uh, you know, it's after all the ones that were on the the page, but I think people know that one. They know that. The, yeah. You have uh, uh, drawn many uh, uh, of these naked emperors. You have Kwame, you have PW, you have um, His Excellency Zuma, and here it is. This is the one? Yeah. Right. Okay. So now it will be bad news because uh, this court case will be blown up across the world. And, and they won't want that before my heart. No, they won't. I, I, I mean, I, the, the spear was a really fascinating thing because uh, the, you know the, the, it was not the not Zuma but the ANC who took uh, Brett Murray and the Goodman Gallery to court. Um, but this is Zuma, and it was in his capacity as 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 ANC. And in fact, the first one he was still he was he was not even deputy president. He had been fired. So he was just as a, as, a, as a private person. The second one was, he was also him as a private person. By that time, he was uh, ANC uh, president, but not yet president of the country. 
So, so in neither case was was the, were the, the cartoons that I've drawn that he's suing me for about drawing something about a president. I don't think it makes a hell of a lot of difference, really. I mean, to me, a political a political person is a political person. He's a public figure. It's in the public domain. But but the, but he just to put that thing straight, it wasn't about him as president. Um, but if it, if it does go to court, it will be. It will become about somebody who is president and who's continues pursuing these these things against a media person, a satirist, a, a, a cartoonist, and that will it will be, it will be big. When you when you drew that, did you have a feeling? Whoops! Whoops! What am I doing now? <laughs> I did actually. I, I, no, I mean it's, it's, it's really it's the most incredible thing because when I, I suddenly I suddenly realised. I mean, it's, you know, I told you that I get these things from verbal from verbal things. It was nothing to do with the rape case. It was nothing to do with that. I said, I just said to myself, he's bloody raping the justice system. And bingo. And it's and, I, and then I went, oh, I genuinely made that sound. And the most incredible thing was then I drew this little rough drawing. And I often draw rough drawings that I give to editors, or I send, you know, I send them, or I show some, and I showed it to my wife, I showed it to like two or three other people, and they all went <gasps> like that. And then when I showed it to my, I, I sent it to my, I said, it was, my editor was in, in Job, and all, all my editors are based in Job, and I said to him, listen, I've got something, he said, I'm out on Friday night, and I'm going to, I said, no, I have to show you. So he said, he said I'm at a restaurant. So uh, he didn't have a phone that I could send, not on those days. So he said, I said, can you give me a fax number? So he got me a fax number for the restaurant. <laughs> and he tells this story. He says that, he says that this guy, the waiter, came from the fax machine. And the waiter said, <laughs> and then he looked at it and he went, oh. and uh, then Andy Mason, who's, who's um, Somebody that I, you, you, you underestimated the number of times I've come to stand with. I come here a lot, and um, I see today so many, so many different faculties that are interested in helping, which is great. Andy Mason had a, a historical a history conference that he was he was at. He was at he was convening some people. And the, the morning that that thing came out, I brought the actual newspaper to him, and he went. <laughs> And then he showed it to everyone in the room, and they all went. And then he wrote an, art, a, an article called "The Shark Can Take a Breath" about this and about the consequences. And it really, it's still it's still got that kind of. Uh, but in it's what you want most. Yeah, no, no. I, I'll stand by that one. I mean, I also mentioned the other one that I said that I did my ill-judged little okay. recently. Yeah, I, I think it would be kind of weird not to mention it because I, I did something which I, I don't think it was my proudest moment. I was on my the, 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 if you know, don't know what I'm talking about. This the recent I love the around that limerick that I did with a little drawing. It is there somewhere as well. He is just the dick we thought he was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still kind of proud of my little limerick, but it should have stayed. It should. It shouldn't have. It, that drawing and that limerick. I I misjudged. How it would how it would play out the public domain. It didn't have the nuance and the subtext and all of those other things that I can back up. I thought people would read that stuff into it, but I was wrong. And and they, uh, you've got it there. Yeah. I mean, I still like my memory. Um, see, at the top there, at the top, the reason I brought it back was it said. I mean, you can see I'm proud of it still, in, in, even though I should be ashamed. But. Uh, the, the sphere to be raised at Social Cohesion Summit, which I thought was funny, and, because I, I read that, and then I had done this for, I have to confess, I did it for a friend's party, and then I thought I could just add that title and I, I was going overseas. But uh, um, I, I'll, I'll read it because it's poetry. I, Those sexes is publicized sport, Zuma took the dick painting to court. So in Brett's free expression confirmed the impression he's as big a dick as we thought, which, which I, I do still like, and I, I kind of like the little drawing, but it was a bit stupid, to, and I rushed my editor into it. So uh, it, this is a mea culpa public kind of apology for, not for, I, I said to Marlene on the phone the other day, is it this not, I didn't cross a legal boundary, in my opinion, I didn't cross a moral boundary, I didn't cross even a good taste boundary. That is, to me, it's totally arbitrary. I still think, I do think he's a dick. 
I'll say that publicly. Um, I do think that he is he is damaging the country by being a, a hypocrite on on, on sexual uh, sexual mores that he because they because they impact so much on HIV and because he, he there are you ask Peter the case there are kids who actually thought that they could have showers after he said that thing, they have a shower and then they won't get infected, etc, etc. So there are a hell of a lot of reasons why I, I do, I, st I actually stand by that thing in its sentiment. But I, what the boundary that I crossed was the good sense boundary. It, I just didn't realize how it would play out in the, in the, in the public domain. And, th and that, luckily for me, I feel like I haven't crossed that so much. I've, I've mostly, I can really back up. So here, I'm showing this to you now, but I'm, I'm really debating whether or not I put it into my next, if I put it into my next book, it may be really small with a, with a little essay kind of talking, talking my way through it. I think, uh, I said to Jonathan, uh, being the soldier he is, and in the battles he fights, that it's normal to get a little chink, a tiny one, a little scuff. It may not be so tiny, because they might use it okay. against me. I don't think they'll have a legal yeah. reason to use, but I think some people might use it against me. I think I did, I did it's a, it was a stupid, so I'll, I'll have to figure out how I handle that. Well, you are forgiven. The point is, you can't say 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 you can not 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 say you as the only, only member standing up for him. And then you've had him on the union buildings. And then you've had him coming as a shower head from a fly, Peter. Yeah. The shower head from the fly. The spear from the fly. That was my parody of Brent Murray's yeah. parody of the Lennon painting. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, anyhow, so it was just waiting for that. <laughs> but this one, I mean, this one, I'll, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm properly proud of this. I'm not just sort of proud at a party or, or able to show a bunch of poets that I, that I can write doggerel or whatever. But I'm, I'm, I'm this one, this one, I, I feel was an, it was a, a nice way, a really good way to parody what was in, what was there, and to do something. And in a way, what I wanted to do here. Was, well, up there it says, with apology to Brett Murray, no apology to President Zuma, want respect, earn it. So that's a kind of little kind of editorializing up there. But this, to put this here was, was, was a kind of waiting to happen. And then, and then this part, sex scandals, corruption, nepotism, cronyism. I mean, that's all the subtext stuff that's missing from the, other, from the other one. And that's also, in a way, recontextualizing what, what happened to Brett. I mean, Brett's, Brett's painting was decontextualized deliberately by the bullies. And they really bullied Sid the Press. And the burial effigy has now actually kind of, she's regretted that she, she caved in. Uh, and it was really sad to see it happen at the time. I really felt it was felt for her. Immense pressure. Huge pressure. And Brett was, was under enormous pressure as well. Yeah. Brett Murray and the gallery, the Dublin Gallery. You know him from I, yeah, I actually um, just confirmed with him and he came around to my house the other day and I said to him, how old, I've been saying publicly that I was, I think, nine and he was eight. And uh, the, the reason and the reason that I was wrong was that he was, he, he reminded me that he, I knew he was small, but he said he was the tiniest guy in the whole school, even like, he was much smaller than all the standards above him. He's a really chunky little strong guy. But uh, so I was 12 and he was 11, I think, or something when we first met. At Rondebosch, was uh, we were at Rondebosch uh, School, and he's 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 been under unbelievable pressure, and he's just kind of coming out of it now. He's the last time I saw him, he was like he was he was ready to fight again, right. which is good. Ready to fight again, which is good. What will you do if you get banned by the media tribunal? If it ever happens, I think the media tribunal has been kind of rolled back quite a lot. I mean, you know, the, 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 the protection of the information bill, the secrecy bill, got, even that got amended quite a lot. But, and I think eventually, I think that we'll eventually win this fight. And I, I do, I, I think so. The media tribunal, now it's, um, what's the term? Can, ooh, 
the, 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 the media tribunal they're referring now, they, they've changed the, the what they, they, it's independent co, okay. independent co-monitoring or something like that. Some, some job. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, they're going to have people who are not, they're going to have some people who are not media people who, who, who are involved in yeah. monitoring the media, but it's not government. So, it's, yeah, and if they, if they, if, if, if it is a credible body and they make credible decisions that, I mean, I, you, nobody's infallible. I don't, I don't mind. I mean, if I'd be taken to the Human Rights Commission and I would have listened to their, yeah. their uh, thing, if they, and luckily they ruled in my favor. Yeah. Um, it was about the Lady Justice Royal, it was Guti Manamela who took me to, to, to yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, 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 you have to, if, you, if you're going to be part of the media, you hope that the media institutions themselves are, are good. If it's government, you can be damn sure that it's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you certainly won't be waiting for a phone call from uh, the guy up there. But you once had a phone call. You had a phone call when you did a critical, a critical cartoon of Mandela after you found that his halo had slipped a bit. Uh, would you care to... Uh, how that conversation you, you're actually linking two things that weren't simultaneous. I've, the one that happened, the drawing I did was the first really critical cartoon I did of him, uh, 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 which may appear at some point. But it, um, it, that was in 95, I think, the, the, the drawing. But this, no, this, I, I have told this story many times. Forgive me if you've heard the story before, because uh, I, wherever I go, I mean, people ask me about it, and it is, was very really powerful thing to happen to me. So I, I do talk about I it. I ask you to end on a positive yeah. note. <laughs> so I was sitting at my desk, this is early 98, sitting at my desk on an ordinary day, this is in the previous house that we were in. And the phone rings and um, my wife says to me, it's president's office on the line. And the diva was still president. So I thought, that's interesting. But I thought it was you know, somebody asking some for doing that. Even that was really, really interesting. But then this woman said, hold on for President Mandela. So I thought, oh, yeah, that's one of my friends playing around. That's centrally flat by the righteous, and it's, it's nothing serious, just the occasional slip halo. So she left us with 95. So I'm waiting, on the, I'm waiting, and I'm, I'm busy drawing. I've got a pen in my mouth, and I have to just draw, and I'm waiting. And suddenly this voice comes in. Hello, it's Dr. Zapiro. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, no, I wasn't sure. I mean, I really thought it was like this. Yes. Uh, this is our president, Mandela. Uh, it, it sounds like you, so it must be you. That's what I actually said. They said, uh, I'm very upset with you. So I thought, oh, here it is. Now, now you re I really suddenly, all these things flash through my mind. I've done something. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what have I done? So he said, oh, I just, he was just playing around. He, he saw that I, my drawings would no longer be appearing every day in the Argus, because they used to appear in the Soviet and then get reprinted in the Argus. And he said, oh, and I'm in Cape Town. Uh, yeah, he really liked to see them. He wanted to see them every day. And now he wasn't going to see them. So he phoned me. <laughs> I was like, you know, obviously it was tongue-tied for a while, and I said, I, said I'm, I'm, I can't believe you actually picked up the phone and, and you phoned me. And I said, but, but I said, I want to say one other thing, because then I kind of got my tongue back. And I said, I want to, I, I'm just so honored that you did that. I'm amazed that you did that. After you, in the, in the sort of three or four years since I met you, because I met him in 94, I said, you would have seen the cartoons getting more and more critical of of the ANC and of government. And he said, oh, but that is your job. <laughs> Which is the most incredible thing that anyone could say. I mean, that Nelson Mandela could actually phone me and then say that. That's the best thing. That's, that's one of the things that obviously sits. You need things like that that sit in your head and kind of keep you going. So I believe it is my job. But if you get it from him, it helps. <laughs>